Perhaps the signature inhabitants of the New World, the Thief Wyverns made their appearance in Monster Hunter World, across several biomes with some of the most in-depth ecology. Their persistent presence as both predators and prey, as well as their occasional role as keystone individuals, can make them a linchpin for competitive inter- and intra-interactions seen. So let's explore the greats of Jagras and Giros and Dodo Gamma too. Before we dive in, a huge thanks to the Superist Duper for sponsoring this video using the Zora Magdros Patron tier. Their patience and generosity for this channel and their video's creation are greatly appreciated, as was the choice of video topic finally prompting me to look into the Thief Wyverns in depth. As ever, I hope it delivers. Let's start with the starter, Great Jagras. Perhaps the leading question many may have is what's with the gluttony? Predation on large prey from comparatively lower ranked monsters isn't that rare, but why does the big iguana have its unique method of feeding? And it may be more of a method to keep such kills, rather than make them initially. Small carnivorans like jackals and small cats, for the most part, aren't as well adapted to regularly kill large prey as their bigger cousins, even if they may look seemingly like miniature copies of them. But despite their internal anatomical differences, a lot of smaller species can still kill large prey with surprising proficiency, and in some areas with larger carnivorans being extirpated, big game can make up a fair portion of their diet. But the latter statement is the key part of it, and when small carnivores make such ambitious kills in more intact ecosystems, they rarely get to keep it. The noise and smell of the kill, coupled with the high densities of bigger competitors, results in you burning a lot of energy taking something big down, and then getting little to no energy recouped when it gets quickly stolen. So Great Jagra sculping down the prey in one may be a method to quickly conceal any odours of the kill, as well as hiding it physically away from the kill site by moving off after eating. When we consider the different areas other animals may frequent, this can be applied too. Anjanath prefers more open areas which coincides with good grazing for Aptanoth, who will also utilise such areas chiefly, despite the risk posed to both them and Jagras. Great Jagras can hunt in the high risk area, quickly swallow its kill and then hastily leave back to the thicker, more dense rainforest that's a lower risk environment before it gets discovered and potentially attacked. Much like the Dromes, Great Jagras suffers dearly at the hands of larger predators, and most notably Anjanath. With two recorded cases of intraguild predation coming from the resident Anjanath that lived around Astera prior to its death at the hands of the Sapphire Star, three if you count their turf war, it's pretty clear that Anjanath can be a notable cause of mortality even on an individual level, with Anjanath seemingly killing Great Jagras for both immediate energetic gain and the removal of a competitor, and the latter likely comes from high prey overlap. Great Jagras is literally a starter monster that's helping itself to the same diet that Apex is eat with its diet of Aptanoth, so it's competing with monsters that outrank it in just about every way conceivable. High mortality from larger predators is common in smaller carnivores, with it potentially accounting for a third of mortality on average, and in some populations of some species with frequent interactions like coyotes and cougars, almost a quarter of the population removal per annum. So similarly, Great Jagras may have equivalent levels of mortality from Anjanath. This may sound like an unacceptable level of risk Great Jagras should be trying to evolve away from, but bear in mind that the prey swallowing may already be an adaptation to mitigate things, as well as moving away from just scavenging and instead finding their own Aptanoth, rather than entering direct fine-scale areas of Anjanath use. And as well, like with coyotes and cougars, the reward may be well worth the risk. Coyotes will readily scavenge for the reward of a lot of meat, despite the risk of cougar attack. The increase and maintenance in bodily condition Great Jagras get from regular large prey predation allow them to take and hold harems of females. And similarly, if regurgitated meat possibly functions as something of a mating dowry or nuptial gift, then males can court more female Jagras with bigger prey too. That all may make entering high-risk areas of Anjanath predation worthwhile. Jagras as a species are still pretty fecund, 
with large numbers of females producing large numbers of eggs every year, and possibly with a male bias too. So despite frequent intraguild predation from Anjanath, there's always plenty more great Jagras flooding back in, regardless of predation. It's worth noting in the broader context of things how quest ranks mean very little ecologically, despite what Capcom may sometimes think, and that Great Jagras is still a top order carnivore despite its role as a starter monster. Great Jagras is undeniably the largest and most physically powerful starter thus far and would convincingly mince both the rest of the starter roster and several higher-ranking monsters too. The African Carnivore Guild varies in size and power from Painted Wolf to Lion, a size difference of around 800%. Despite considerable prey overlap and them sharing the role of top order predator with several other animals intermediate in size between the two. Indeed, the law states that Great Jagras predation levels may even be comparable to larger monsters in general. Great Jagras may be a starter monster, but it's still absolutely on par with Anjanath and Rathalos as a top predator in the ancient forest, sharing high prey overlap with them, even if it kicks off world's gameplay and fares poorly in competitive interactions with them. Them. And Great Jagras is a powerful predator in its own right. Equipped with a very powerful set of jaws, it tends to kill even large prey quickly with a single devastating bite, one that presumably causes catastrophic trauma in the bite area and cripples the prey in the rare occasion it manages to get away before it succumbs to the internal trauma. With a very large head and a thick muscular neck, Great Jagras is very much built with all its power up front, where it matters. Even if not sluggish and lizard-like internally, it's still not really built for a swift or sustained chase past the initial lunge, and likely doesn't pursue prey especially far in an actual chase. When Great Jagras has succeeded in killing a big prey item, its chief party trick comes into play with its ability to swallow it whole. In this regard, it's tempting to compare Great Jagras to the Boadae, perhaps the most famous family of animals for swallowing big things whole. But boas have a flexible skull capable of kinesis and no limbs. Great Jagras has a presumably very solid skull for a large bite force and limbs too. So it's probably more accurate to compare Great Jagras to a large frog, like a bullfrog, pac-man or horned frog. Such frogs have evolved very large and especially very wide heads for the biggest gape possible to consume prey whole, along with other adaptations like fangs to help hold the prey and work it down too. Similarly, limbs help stabilise the frog and potentially move the prey around too. In Great Jagras's case, it uses a similar system with a huge wide head, with the width of the head and jaws almost being the widest point of the body, the shoulders only just being marginally wider. Said width is almost on par with that of an even adult Aptonoth's widest point too, allowing such huge targets to be swallowed. Great Jagras then uses its legs to push itself over the prey whilst using the front fangs to help work the prey down, before it pushed itself into its bipedal position to rearrange the prey into its stomach and swallow any outlying areas. Having succeeded in glugging down a whole Aptonoth, Great Jagras then has to digest it. Great Jagras seemingly has very powerful stomach acid that can both damage itself and be used offensively against other animals. Something curious mentioned in the World Book is that Great Jagras generally prefers to catch more prey and partially digest it, over digesting entire large animals whole, which is odd to say the very least. This doesn't actually seem more efficient, as surely the very energy-rich organs would go undigested, and Great Jagras would surely want some calcium from the bones too. But there are other reasons for possible regurgitation. Ambitious animals swallowing too many or too much large prey can sometimes die afterwards. Not from exploding. That old news story of the invasive python bursting after eating an alligator is a tabloid myth, and was actually believed to be attacked and torn open by another large alligator but rather from suffocation. Bitis vipers have occasionally fallen foul of this, and whilst Great Jagras hasn't been recorded to suffocate, it could also be that pulmonary distress or hyperventilation causes it to sometimes regurgitate huge meals. Boas too, when accosted by dangerous competitors, will also regurgitate meals to help their own escape, and hopefully provide a distraction for the attacker. 
Perhaps Great Jagras may do the same when accosted by its dangerous rivals in the ancient forest. Great Jagras will also willingly regurgitate for the pack, feeding them extensively on the partly digested mead. Jagras females normally hunt small game like shepherd hares, and the regurgitated meat is more accessible protein and less roughage. This, among other steps, could be considered a nuptial gift from Great Jagras to its pack. Such gifts have actually very recently been seen in reptiles, and are from one partner to another to fundamentally help improve fitness. And by feeding its pack, Great Jagras prevents them entering risky areas to feed, burning their own energy, and helps them produce young. Overall, this helps significantly with lifetime fecundity. And this is one of several reasons for Great Jagras to become its great self. The more food Great Jagras can supply, the more females it can court, and the better condition they'll be in to produce as many healthy young as they can. Gift size increases female fecundity, and for Great Jagras, the bigger the male, the more able it is to both kill and transport large prey like Aptonoth, for as many females as possible. A female Jagras lays on average three or four eggs, surprisingly few considering their numbers, and a successful male can hope to mate with 10 to 20 Jagras, giving average of 30 to 80 offspring sired at the egg stage at least. But if we suggest a large above average male keeps his harem well fed enough to produce above average amounts, and also courts a larger number of females, it could well reach up to 150 or so sired offspring. All in all, a big boost of fecundity in a single season. So it's in a great Jagras' net interest to be as big as possible, and take prey as large as possible for this reason, regardless of risk to itself. On top of this, there's also other great Jagras to consider. Male Males fight one another for dominance and to take control of a harem, so larger body size is obviously a benefit in intraspecific combat. The biggest males are again more likely to take control over a harem and beat away rivals. Surprisingly, Great Jagras apparently return to their rough birthplace to take over a harem, which isn't really what you'd expect as there's the risk of being related to the other Jagras in these groups. This may be why female Jagras select for the considerably older males though. It's unknown how long it takes Great Jagras to fully mature, and how long their dispersal voyage is. But considering their size, it could be some time. The longer the dreadlocks and the larger the eardrums of a Great Jagras, the more attractive they are to the females, and said size and length also indicates age. It could be there's quite a disparity in lifespan between the two, and males leave to allow genetic reshuffling to occur in their absence. And females select for older males due to the fact they won't be, or will be considerably less related to them to keep genetic diversity going. Things aren't always so rosy between the females and males though, and Great Jagras will occasionally eat the smaller females. Cannibalism isn't rare in the animal kingdom, nor among predators, and likely not among monsters either. And so such predation shouldn't be viewed as hugely unusual if still an interesting artifact of behaviour. While this is likely to simply satiate hunger in the moment, we could also make the fanciful suggestion it's another attempt at preventing inbreeding, and Great Jagras males eat any females whose scent they recognise from their adolescence. So a mix of both male competition and female provisioning drives the incredible sexual dimorphism between male and female Jagras, to create the signature appearances of the different sexes. But there's not quite as much information on how the two function when apart. Jagras are considerably more cautious than their male counterparts, and may also be partially nocturnal, originally being slated to prefer deep cover and the thicker parts of the map. They also have some arboreal ability, and overall may spend a lot of their time in trees or deep cover, generally avoiding the open areas of the forest. The eggs are laid in sunny clearings where they're warmed by the ambient temperature and the decaying mulch of the forest floor, and are frequently eaten by Kulayaku. Despite Kulu's introduction being in the ancient forest, it's principally described and intended as a creature of the wild spire, mainly moving into the forest for the Jagra slaying season. Despite considerable offspring provisioning and the social nature of the pack, Jagras seemingly don't protect their eggs and may not even rear their young either, despite the fact subadult male Jagras are in the main pack. Much of the fanged wyvern juvenile years are unknown, with only Zenoga possibly being the aberration with having parental care. But it does seem for the most part the New World fanged wyverns just aren't especially doting parents, with little offspring care. 
Interestingly, the Wild Spire is deprived of any fanged wyverns outside of occasional visits by Ebony Odogaron, with it not seeming especially clear why, when the Wild Spire is perhaps the most productive desert seen in the series thus far, and so claims of prey numbers or water dependency don't really seem to fit here. The next large fanged wyvern is Great Gyros, a large serpentine quadruped that makes up the most common member of the Rotten Vale scavenger community. Perhaps the two most notable things about Great Gyros are its fangs and gills, both key parts of its survival in the Vale. The gills of the Gyros are interesting, and a surprising adaptation for a terrestrial animal to have so far from water. Obviously, these are for effluvium, and allow the Gyros to move through the deeper or more effluvium-riddled parts of the Vale, or cope with considerable effluvium increases before Val sorts things out. Land gills are an odd concept, but not entirely foreign, with some crab species still using them to breathe on land, and especially Christmas Island crabs which can breathe as well in air with their gills as they can with their lungs. But such gills need changes, and land crab gills are reinforced with chitin to help them support themselves, and prevent them sticking together in the air. This fits with gyros gills, which are muscular organs the gyros can control. The Christmas Island crab's exceptional breathing is facilitated by their exercise, such as their migration and other activities like burrowing too, which increases hemolymph flow through the gills to offload the oxygen built up to the tissues. So great gyros may be somewhat similar. It is mentioned it can only spend a limited amount of time in the very effluvium heavy areas. Great Gyros and underlings likely don't mess around in such voyages, and have a clear goal when entering them for either forage, territory crossing, escaping threats, or finding mates. And Gyros may have to burn energy to have the guilds running at maximum efficiency. Perhaps ironically, Great Gyros seems the least adapted to the Vale itself, despite being the only resident monster without a non veiled subspecies, or a similar close relative outside the Vale. This may stem from the fact we don't know much about what Gyrus evolved from, and what the ecology of its ancestors were pre-Vale. Radobar and Anacidic Glavinus both derived from their volcanic counterparts that doubtless already had mechanisms in place to filter volcanic gases. Val is a weird elder, whose weirdness probably involves weird ways of breathing. An Odogaron is also a little unknown too, but many Vale species colonised this unusual ecosystem with their former adaptations, so maybe the gills or gill-like structures already existed in Gyros. As after all, they do have a parallel use in that they house and collaborate with an organ that allows Great Gyros to make their signature calls. With the open, exposed tissue, it could be possible some gas exchange originally occurred here, to help with the calls or just for respiration or other uses. Then this got adapted into how Great Gyros grew its true gills. In combat, male Great Gyros will often target each other's gills, and often sport severe wounds from such fights. As well as damaging the vocal ability, it could be worth noting this could limit a male's ability to traverse the veil if such wounds are very severe too. Great Gyros's fangs are its signature weapons, laden with a neurotoxin that can easily stun other large monsters. Perhaps surprisingly, these are described as tools for hunting, which is a little odd as Great Gyros and its pack seem to function chiefly as scavengers in the Vale, with further lore mentioning this too. The Vale is possibly the only place carrion is dense enough to facilitate such large and social scavengers at this density. Neurotoxin venom doesn't just paralyse your movement, movement, but your breathing, circulation, and other bodily functions as well. So whilst it could be used for very fast or armoured prey, this is likely something that Gyros had prior to their further evolution in the Vale and simply kept. It could be argued this still applies to a few prey items. Rafinos are still present in the Vale, and as volant animals are still likely fairly hard to catch for Gyros. Paralytic venom could even the odds. Similarly, if a very hungry, Radoban could be a potential prey item. Great Gyros et al. will sometimes over-optimistically attack large brute wyverns, and Radoban is a far more likely candidate to be taken down than Acidic Glavinus. It could also be that the venom was saved for competitive reasons. Venom isn't just deadly water. It's a mix of proteins that are very expensive to make in the large quantities Great Gyros and Pack do. You wouldn't really keep it for very long as an evolutionary holdover as you'd start to shed your expensive crap quite quickly. 
but it may be kept for Odogaron. Odogaron is a very successful scavenger, and can often be seen to fight with Great Giros, that often results in it getting paralysed. Venom for self-defence typically isn't neurotoxic, rather it's focused on making as much pain as possible, but it could be that the neurotoxin is so successful against Odogaron that Great Giros kept it, and modified it even further to spit it at foes, rather than changing its chemical nature. Again, being stunned isn't just frozen in place, it's not being able to breathe and experiencing brachycardia, whilst being mauled by Giros in this case too. In short, being paralysed is a very bad experience that may be one of the few things to put Odogaron off, and this is a very good trait for Giros to have. Great Giros is described as cautious and discerning as a monster, picking its battles carefully and knowing when to fold them when things get too hot. Ignore Acidic's cutscene. If Great Giros folded every time Odogaron showed up, it may eat seriously into foraging success and the quality of kills it can acquire. After all, as said in Odogaron's video, not all carcasses are equal, with fresher being better for both mineral and water content so its paralytic venom may be useful in keeping Great Giros a current player in the extensive guild of carrion eaters in the Vale. The final large member of the trio is Dodo Gamma, the large and solitary fanged wyvern of the volcanic elder's recess. Dodo Gamma has a bizarre diet compared to its relatives, eating rocks instead of meat. Dodo Gamma doesn't necessarily eat the rock itself, but rather crunches it up to process out the dragon crystals like sorting the wheat from the chaff. The explosive rocks spat at the player are the regurgitated low-value leftovers. A body needs fuel to keep it going and minerals to fulfil internal processes, and with the unique dragon crystals providing sufficient energy and other rocks in its territory providing base minerals, it does seem Dodogamma can sustain itself off mere rock alone. A weird diet needs a weird mouth too, and Dodogamma has a truly bizarre jaw. The mandible is large with no teeth. The rough protrusions on the jaw aren't bone, but in fact grown shell plates that it can expand and retract on a muscular membrane. Dodogamma's mouth can expand and contract as it forages and crunches up rocks, and this isn't so unusual. A lot of animals that do scoop-based feeding, which Dodogamma seems to, also have jaws that can bow. From them, we can suggest that Dodogamma's mandible is actually solid bone to allow it greater flexibility, and with comparatively little mineralization to allow it to bow even further, so Dodogamma can take in more rocks. The shell plates function more like the lateral bending zone in pelicans, and are large, solid structures spaced with elastic connective tissues and muscle in between, to allow the overall part of the mandible flexibility. Unlike the jaw itself, the shell plates and lateral bending zones are likely quite high in mineralization. What Dodogamma ate before he swapped to some delicious rocks is unknown, but my own suggestion would be invertebrates, or really anything that lived in the soil. Dodogamma's squat lifestyle of partial burrowing and rootling through the rocks is reminiscent of something that forages in the soil, or rather substrate, and so the most frequent foods found here are invertebrates, or things like roots and tubers. Insectivores can often eat a lot of soil as they forage, and Dodogamma for one reason or another may have had the ability to digest dragon crystals anyway, or many things may have it, and just choose not to eat them. As volcanicity increased, and most importantly for such a change, the substrate became more nutritious than the things living in it, Dodogamma made the full switch to an Earth Eater. Compared to the rest of its distant family, Dodogamma is also conspicuously single, seemingly living a mostly solitary lifestyle with no pack. One reason for this suggested is diet, that you don't really need a pack to hunt down rocks. But then the greats don't really use their packs for hunting either, rather the other way around where their actions more support their harems so diet may still factor in here but for different reasons. Without the need for a keystone male to either provision or find carcasses, female Dodogamma ancestors didn't have to hang around males anymore, and could go off by themselves. 
With this, an increase in female body size would potentially be beneficial, as it means they can muscle in on good crystal spots that males may otherwise monopolise. With these crystals presumably distributed fairly evenly over the recess, Dodogamma may not be hugely territorial, and females may not frequently gather in certain areas to be monopolised by males. So evenly distributed resources, the inability to reliably keep multiple females for males, as well as intraspecific competition between between males and females may cause a comparative lack of sexual dimorphism in Dodogamma compared to much of its kin. Dodogamma's brightly coloured tail sticks out against a dark elder's recess, and it seems like a potential hazard with things like elder dragons around. Many lizards can be brightly coloured, and in more spectrums than we can see too, and in males this is typically a display of fitness in one way or another. Ornate crevice dragons are sexually dichromatic in both males and females, though the coloration doesn't actually seem to indicate female quality, but rather reproductive availability at the time. So these may be important signals both sexes of Dodo Gamma have, albeit with different meanings for them. The bright colours may also be intentional to distract attackers too, and the initial assault may be drawn to the posterior of Dodo Gamma rather than the more vulnerable head, allowing Dodo Gamma to either defend its Self or flee should the tail be torn off. As Dodogamma are clearly aware of this signal being noticed by other animals, and sleep partially buried in the ground with only their head visible to hide the brightly coloured hindquarters as they rest. The expandable stomach may also come into play here too. If ambushed by something that tries to drag them out the hole, like a chuckwalla, Dodogamma may defensively inflate itself to make itself much harder to extricate and leave the attacker with a biting, firebombing head. It may not be a coincidence that in the old world, Basarios has a similar defence of burying itself to rest, and being very hard to extricate. In other ways, it's also suggested the environment is a reason for large body size, with smaller terrestrial creatures apparently having a tough time in such areas. But being big does have its consequences, and especially in a hot zone like a volcano. Dodogamma's rotund appearance may seem less than ideal, here, but this is actually by design too. Dodogamma's stomach is elastic, and when expanded can function as a thermal window, flushing heat out away from the torso and internal organs. On top of this, Dodogamma also has a resting body temperature naturally higher than many other fanged wyverns, which may also be a reoccurring trait in many volcanic animals. Overall, I think the Thief Wyverns are pretty good. If not for the existence of Celtus, I think Jagras would probably be the best starter monster. It's still pretty good, but it just takes too long to get going and often dies before it really does. Taking two pins to get to its fat state is a lot. Overall, Great Jagras really feels like it has the shadow of Capcom's paranoia of world not selling well over it, and so is pretty easy so that new players would get a win first thing and keep playing, which is a shame, as high and G-rank Great Jagras aren't bad, and if it was allowed to use its moves more and achieve its fed state easier, it'd be really good. Easily the best starter monster if that was the case. I do wish they'd swapped Cooler and Great Jagras so the latter could have had more to do, but then Cooler might may not be monstrous enough for a starter monster. Plus, Great Jagras was also mentioned as a test early on of what they wanted and what they could do with Monster Hunter World, hence it having a lot of environmental behaviours with eating Aptonoth and feeding its Jagras. It was something of an early benchmark for such things, and whilst it may be a bit of a punching bag for a starter monster, it is a good monster to introduce the player to World as a game and its concepts. With some tweaks, Great Jagras could have been truly excellent but we'll have to settle for being pretty good and the second best starter monster. Great Giros, on the other hand, is... Okay. After the peak of Anjanath, it, Sitsi, Palumu, and to a certain extent Radabon all feel a bit like a mid-game slump for World. None of them are actually bad. In fact, I thought Palumu was a pretty good fight that also packed a good wallop if you weren't really ready for it. And Radabon is the best version of Uragon yet. But all of them just don't feel as interesting, characterful, or exciting to fight as the monsters that came before or after them. Sitsi is just pretty boring across the board. Board, in fact. The design is fine, if a little uninspired. The gills and such are a nice touch, 
as is the way it uses the Gyros. And the good show don't tell rivalry with its Venom and Odogron's weakness to paralysis was also nice, and a rare example of a lower ranking monster getting a leg up on a high ranking one. Again, there's still things to like about Great Gyros, and it's not that it's bad, it's just not that good compared to the rest of World's roster. Dodogamma also isn't bad. I don't find it that cute though, shoot me. As a volcano monster, it's pretty good. Though as said prior, it can feel a little weird in the grand scheme of world, due to the Elder's Recess being a bit half-baked compared to other maps. Dodogamma works quite well as a greeter for the map though, and was made to be a bit of a cooldown before things picked up with Elders later, even if the fun plummets immediately afterwards with Lavasioth. The three non-Elders of the volcano all feel like they have nothing really to do with each other, and whilst Dodogamma is charming and fun enough that it's the least impacted by this, it's still a bit hurt by the fact the recess doesn't feel like an ecosystem compared to the other maps in World. Dodogamma's environmental behaviours are also baked into its fight, which is pretty nice, and overall there's a good display going on through the fight with its jaws and stomach too. Dodo's firebombing can also really help against other monsters, so that's another pro. Overall, he's pretty good in isolation. Shame about his circumstances. Part of me does wonder if they should have taken off his tail and made him a super toad as suggested, but then having a big toad with a huge exploding rock flinging jaw likely would have made everyone think they were ripping off Berserk Tetsu Cabra. Thanks for watching, and once again thanks to the Super Astupa for sponsoring this video. The Bandit Wyverns may seem like ripe fruit for the picking for such a video, but it took me so long to cover them as in hindsight I felt all pack leader monsters should have been in one video. That would have been the first broader topic exploring the Keystone individual hypothesis, and I was concerned covering the Bandit Wyverns would risk rehashing a lot of that, and then just leave Dodogamma out cold as he probably doesn't have enough for his own video, but their prompt led me to doing it, and their additional questions also fleshed it out a lot in ways I wouldn't have considered looking into. As well, thanks to top patron Phenomenon for their ongoing support, as well as to patrons Kate Sandum, Big Al, Arangar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Inventory Overflow, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archzor Queen, Seth Fake Class Name, Zaysa, Karazal, Dodogamma, Dekabloss, and Bazu Gazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their ongoing generosity. Thanks as ever to Kamen Rider Motun 2 for their assorted Monster Hunter behavioural digital artwork. For full images and more original pieces, you can follow them on their assorted social media linked in the description, and there are always new pieces being made. Thanks too to I Am The Kaiju King for his excellent Thief Wyvern skulls, created after a Tumblr poll to pick the family after King's indecision, and the Svenakodon Today won. For more of these, as well as more artwork and original content, be sure to follow him on Tumblr, and if you can, support his Patreon too. Links to both are provided in the description. Thanks also to Glide Borealis for once again allowing me to use footage from their natural monster hunter cutscenes and their short documentaries. You can check both of these out on their own channel linked in the description too, and be sure to subscribe for their work. And for next time, try to figure out who'll be featured.